Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Birch and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. Our lecture today is sponsored by the Preservation Association of Lincoln. If you're interested in these programs, please join our membership. Um, you can join by going to preservelincoln.org. Our speaker today is Bob Ripley. Bob is the Capital Administrator for the Office of the Capital Commission in the Nebraska State Capitol Building. He's a native of Lincoln, Nebraska. He's a graduate of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln College of Architecture degree with a bachelor's degree in architecture in 1972. He holds both the Nebraska and the National Architectural Licenses. He um, has been in private practice of architecture in Lincoln until taking this position at the Capitol in 1983. And from 1997 through 2000, he also served as the historic preservation consultant for phase three of the Washington Monument Restoration in Washington, DC for project sponsor Target Stores of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Bob's talk today is the Governor's Hearing Room Chair Restoration Project. Please join me in welcoming Bob Ripley. Thank you, Eileen, and um, thank all of you for being here today. Um, I hope a discussion about chairs is enough to capture your imagination. <laughs> but there are chairs, and then there are chairs, and these fall into the second category with a lot more gravitas associated with it. Bear in mind, too, and I apologize to my colleagues here in the room who were involved in this project, this was an 11-year project. So if you think I can squeeze 11 years worth of work down into about 45 or 50 minutes worth of conversation without leaving a few things out, um, I apologize to my colleagues for what they may consider important that I couldn't cover today due to time. I also want to thank uh, Matt Hansen, who's here with us, as well as Roxanne Smith, two colleagues of mine at, at the Capitol Commission office, for their kindness in helping me put together this, uh, this slide presentation. Well, I, I look forward to always talking about what it is we do, but today is especially so. The talent that we have on staff at the Capitol Commission is exemplary, and I think after you see what I present to you today, you will start getting a, a bit of an appreciation for what that really is. Um, as a starting point, I'll give you the, the title slide, and it gives you a reference as to where these chairs were located. The governor's suite was part of the very first phase of construction in the Capitol, uh, which began in 1922 and ended in about 1925. And here's a photograph of the very room and some of the chairs that we'll be speaking about in a moment in terms of the process of restoration. There are actually four chambers that compose the governor's suite in the Capitol. And they were built to impress. In fact, they were changed to be built to impress because since this was one of the few what we call preservation spaces in the first phase, when that first phase was to be done and the public was to be allowed in, they wanted some spaces that would really dazzle the public. So the Capitol Commission made a very conscious effort to ramp up the quality of room finishes in the governor's suite to literally impress the people who came in to see it. And what that means is wainscoats on the wall, wood, they were to be very nice exotic hardwoods, went from chair rail height at about 30 inches above the floor to about seven foot six, which is above the doors. That's only one of the many things that were done. There were murals, expanded mural program. There was custom door hardware added. There was acid, acid etched light fixtures, ornate plaster, and very elaborate textiles, some of which you'll see in a moment. The first phase of the building was finished in 1925 and the furnishings for the four chambers in the governor's suite, however, were not opened until New Year's Day 1928 when Governor and Mrs. Adam McMullen put out an open house to all citizens who wished to take the time to come by and take a look at this very impressive Italian Renaissance style interior. Now you might say, well, what's Italian Renaissance really have to do with the Capitol? Well, it had to do primarily as its jumping off point a stylistic correlation to the work of Augustus Vincent Tack. 
He was the muralist in the governor's suite. He did all the murals in the reception room, and he also did the, uh, an, an additional um, um, increased quality of finish at the dome above the governor's uh, desk in his private office. And to make these allegorical figures, which represents the various aspects of life government is to provide its citizens, he started out with 19th century figures, and he ultimately converted them to much more distant figures in history in terms of their clothing and their garb. He went to, essentially, the Italian Renaissance. And because Tack was chosen by Goodhue before Goodhue's death, untimely death, in 1924, Tack was on the job putting these murals together, and he was well down the road on this Italian Renaissance theme by the time they got to the point of finishing the project, which was putting furnishings in the suite to complement the artwork he was doing. So we know by our archives, Tack played a very significant role in choosing the Italian Renaissance furnishings that are in the governor's suite. Also know that all of the furnishings <coughs> that you may see here in this historic photograph and so on, anything from rugs, furniture of all types, which is seating, desks, tables, consoles, custom lighting, even drapery, um, and accessories like the uh, altars, candlesticks, and ornamental wall hangings were provided to the Capitol through one primary contract administered by Orchard and Wilhelm. And for those of you who might be my age, Orchard and Wilhelm is not a foreign name. It was a company that went out of existence within my lifetime. I think in the 1950s or 60s, they closed up. They were more or less the Marshall Fields or the Carson Perry Scott of Nebraska at that time. And they purchased all of this furniture, and most of the decorating was done through a company known as Shaw Furniture out of New York City. So they did, they had a very sizable contract. Now bear in mind, the entire suite was furnished under a contract with Orchard and Wilhelm for just over $83,000. Now that's a sizable piece of money for four rooms. But if you inflate that to today, that comes out to a little over $1.13 million. So think of it in terms of about a quarter of a million dollars per room as you're going through this suite. So they really, it was no holds barred with regard to trying to impress when it came to the interior furnishings. Well, we were well aware of how exotic these, these finishes were, and to make sure that we didn't drop the ball, we weren't about to rush in to start doing repair and maintenance on these pieces without getting some real serious expertise, because in truth, my good friend Tom Casper and I, who have been working together for 32 two years, Tom approaching 40 years at the Capitol, were, were mindful of how good they were, but we needed an expert's opinion. And this is where a lady by the name of Elizabeth Lahkainen in 1985, a lady that Tom had already established this ongoing professional uh, working relationship with, um, came to us, we hired her, to do a condition report and to analyze all of the textiles and furnishings in the governor's suite. The smartest thing we ever did. She was, Elizabeth was a very experienced fine art and furniture conservator. She's worked on some of New England's most impressive historic monuments, be they residential or commercial, <clears throat> including, I was very surprised one morning I was watching television, a spot on the CVS Sunday morning program where she was interviewed for the conservation work she'd done on this leather rocker that Abraham Lincoln was seated in when he was at Ford's Theater that fateful evening. So this is a woman who's been entrusted with some tremendous assets of American history. We felt very confident she was the right person for the job here. And indeed she came in and her comments to Tom and me at the conclusion of her walk around with us, because we thought she was awfully quiet. And we said, well, what do you think? And her comment was, and bearing in mind of all the places she'd worked prior to that time, she said, I rarely have the opportunity to examine textiles as fine as those found in this governor's suite. And she said, they were the best money could buy then, and they're the best money could buy today. So that set us back a little bit, and we thought, good thing we asked a professional. So Tom and I proceeded on, we thought this is, a, this is a great thing for us to know, not only one, but two, now we have to figure out how to go about paying for this. So we thought, better not jump into the biggest project we can, let's start doing some of the smaller projects in her report that will lead us to the opportunity to do the bigger work. 
So we started small. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, my colleague Tom Casper has been involved in documenting and organizing the furniture, original furniture program in the Capitol since he began in 1977. So we have a lot of history that Tom has brought to the table with regard to not only this suite, but furniture throughout the Capitol. <clears throat> the first project we did was in 1987, initially restoring drapery in the suite and the drapery hardware that went with it. That was, a rel that was a very successful and we were delighted with the result. We next then took on four ha uh, handmade leather swing sling chairs, excuse me, sling chairs, which have a sling seat in them, four of them that sat in front of the governor's desk. We took the best of the four of those chairs and put it in our archive, unrestored. So that, that, that's the documented piece of history that will always be there and it will not be changed by anyone in terms of restoration. It is as close to the original product that we had. Then we paid a conservator to not only restore the chairs, but to build that fourth chair, brand new. If you get a chance to go see the governor sometime, walk in and see if you can pick out which chair it is. I've only found one little difference between it and the other three, and it's literally impossible to tell them. They're, it's a beautiful reproduction. We know which one, however. In addition, we did four of nine what are called banquettes. They were upholstered in mohair. They're gorgeous pieces of furniture. We finished those pieces. They also came out very well. We thought, you know, we've gotten kind of our feet wet on this thing. Working with Elizabeth again, we went to starting a project in the governor's hearing room, which is the, the subject of today's talk. Now, what you see here You'll notice the chairs aren't exactly in sterling condition. The seats are by no means uh, original. We think they were replaced in 1964. And you notice the one sitting closest in the lower left-hand corner, that's the definition of the original bucket seat. Because if you take a real close look at that, uh, it's a bit like sitting down in a four-sided bucket. Many of the chairs in the hearing room at that time were in this condition. So the suspensions had failed years before 1964. The leather seats had, had failed, which would have matched the seat panel that you see behind it. And you'll notice the chair in the second row missing a couple of hunks of leather. This was the condition, and these chairs just continued to decline. So in, 80, in 19, um, 2005, excuse me, we started with the largest number of chairs. There are two types. One, 48 gallery chairs where the audience sits, and there are seven what we call counselor chairs that are high back and much more ornate, which go around the council table at the front of the, t of the chamber. Now, this is a more accurate representation of what many of the chairs looked like by the time we were pulling them out of service. We, we began with Elizabeth researching fabricators who could replicate this leather for the purpose of restoration. And we looked for someone who could make the embossed polychrome panels that you see here on this chair. As well, we needed custom hardware in terms of ornamental nails, they're pierced nails. These nail heads were about an inch, <coughs> inch and a half square of, of cast bronze, beautiful pieces. As well, we needed custom fringe to help us with the counselor chairs. Well, as luck wouldn't have it, Elizabeth was not able to locate a domestic supplier of the custom leather that we wanted. She was able, however, to locate the fabricator of the custom bronze nails as well as the, the uh, fringe that was to go on the counselor chairs as well. Elizabeth working through um, her, her network of design houses and fabricators, and she has contacts who connect all over the, all over the world, uh, located a fabricator in Belgium. Not as close as we would have liked. We'd like to have been involved in the process try as we may, we never could quite get a plane ticket to take us over there and watch that work in progress, not surprisingly, but we ended up getting the product we required by the end of this exchange. As well, something to be noted, you'll, you'll pay attention to the fact that the chairs that you see here have a consistent colored background to them. There isn't a surface of this leather on the face that isn't covered with a paint or a finish. In order to do that, you have to put a metal leaf over the leather because the oil pigments typically that would have been addressed to put the color on would have soaked into the leather and caused it to become brittle, would have gotten damaged that much more quickly. So there's kind of an exotic process of prepping this leather before you put the color on the surface of it. Now, we went through four or five samples. 
we'd send them a sample of our original leather to Belgium. They'd make a sample or two and send it back to us. We had, of course, more samples we could compare to. We weren't getting where we wanted to be. So it was a bit of a problem. It went back and forth four or five times from the middle of the of North American continent to Salem, Massachusetts, where Elizabeth was, over to Belgium, to back and so on, back and forth. A year and a half or so, a year to year and a half, it took for us to negotiate the contract with the Belgian supplier. Now you can start to understand how it takes 11 years on and off to complete a project of this magnitude. Now, we also, in placing the initial order, once it did get on the books, we ordered 10% more material than we felt we'd need to restore the project, which is our shelf stock to allow those who succeed us to do repair and maintenance on these chairs as time passes. You don't go right to the number you need. We always get a little bit of, for the energy it takes to get there, you better order some spares, which we did. Now the process that the uh, Frederick, who's the gentleman in Belgium, used is to take an original piece of leather, one of our samples, one of our pieces that was deupholstered, lay it out flat, mix a ceramic solution and pour it over the top of the leather. It would then cure, then you would separate the two, creating a pattern off of the leather, and then put that into another molten ceramic process and cure both of them so then you have a male and female half of the press. And those were used for the purpose of once the leather was wet, it was put into these molds, it was pressed and you got the border, the, the embossed border around the perimeter of these panels, pull them apart. However, those ceramic molds only lasted for three or four uses, maybe five at the best, and then they had to be replaced, repeating the process. So we went through 20 to 25 of these molds over the course of time for both types of chairs. Now, Frederick's wife was also the woman who was his partner who did the paint work, the color work. Now this is a great example, the reason I show you the back of the chair facing away from us, as we're deupholstering these chairs, notice the back and where the paint is missing and notice the color of the leather. Leather. It almost looks like it's on metal, it looks like rust, in fact that's sometimes what, what the conservation community calls it, it's, or red rot, where the leather was actually, in the 20s they did a lot of processing of leather and there was a lot of beautiful leather work done, but they used a very acidic bath and it tended to it impregnated the leather. Once it was out and in use, the leather would decline more rapidly than had they used a more neutral solution, which they do for tanning leather today. So there are other, some other inherent problems with the failure of the leather on these chairs. Well, meanwhile, back at the Capitol, we're starting to deupholster chairs. They're working in Belgium, we're working in Lincoln, and as we go through this process, we take the existing upholstery system off and realize it's nothing near what would have been used on the building originally. And so this is a process of deupholstering the chair. You can see that there are uh, jute webbing straps that were the suspension. That wasn't the way the seats were originally made. We, we determined that there was a wooden panel that would have supported these originally. And so this second generation upholstery work was something we, we knew we could discount out of hand, but we documented it just the same. In addition, and here's a gentleman by the name of Bill McClure who worked at our shop at the time. He's since retired, but a very talented individual. He's involved in not only deupholstering the chair, cleaning them because there's an enormous amount of dirt and grit on these chairs. You can imagine with 80 to, 80, 80 to 90 years of use, there's a lot of, of soiling that occurs. So he cleaned them up. He also touched up finish, which is what he's doing here when there were chips on the original finish. We do not wholesale strip and refinish chairs. We put finish and stain back where it's been lost, and otherwise the original faint stain and finish on the chairs are retained and we simply touch them up. You notice he's not using a four inch paintbrush there. He's doing it just spot at a time, and that's the way the, bul the bulk of the chair was in fact restored for its wood finish. In addition, this gives you a little bit of an idea along the top of this arm how absolutely bare and void of finish and stain these chairs were. So they were in very rough shape. You can see there's no finish on the front of the arm and even the joinery which you see here. Notice the end of the arm, the cap of the arm, has a round dowel coming up. It has a wooden spline in it that flares it into the opening. It's a quality of craftsmanship rarely seen in furniture today. Now, as well, we needed to structurally rebuild the chairs. They were, the joints were weak. We used 
adhesives, often in injected into the joints with a syringe, and then sometimes the chairs did need to be disassembled and then put back together entirely, but many times we could repair them as they sat, and we would simply clamp them. Now, believe it or not, that is a chair. If you've ever gone into a carpentry shop or a furniture shop, most of the time I go in and see a chair that's being restored, all I see is a pile of clamps. You can't see the piece of furniture for all the clamps that are on it. Well, this chair is just getting started. It isn't completely clamped yet. You can see the amount of hardware it takes to really keep these chairs and put them back into good rigid structural condition. Now, rebuilding, law stain, and finish was done as well, as I'd mentioned. And we also did an enormous amount of research and development within our shop. Now, this represents that. This is what we've determined was really the seat structure of some sort. We tried several options. These four are all options we evaluated. You can see the lower left has webbing in it. It's a wood frame that sits on top of that chair frame that had the bucket in it earlier. But that is the process. We went through these four options before we decided on the one that we ultimately selected, which is in fact this one. Now you're looking at the bottom of the chair here. This is Ron half, half inch plywood on the perimeter. Uh, three quarter inch. Three quarter, thank you. Three quarter inch frame around the outside with an eighth inch plywood insert, which is slotted. This provides flex in the seat pan, so it doesn't feel like you're sitting on a concrete wall with leather on top of it, but it provides the structure because bear in mind, we want it to be sufficiently soft that it's comfortable to sit in, but it has to be stiff enough to keep the leather from flexing a great deal, which will only accelerate the demise of that leather on the chair. So we want it comfortable, but stiff. And we determined after several experiments, this was the solution to the problem. In addition, this is a cutaway from the top. We had to determine what kind of cushion, essentially, you'd have on top of that seat pan. And here you see the various layers. You can see where the screws hold in that eighth inch panel in the center where the flex can occur. You can also see that the first layer is a, a, um, a layer of, I can also read it here, um, a burlap layer, which is typically a layer under all padding. The next layer is, in fact, a 3 8 inch carpet felt on top of that, which is the gray. The next layer is a half inch of dense polyester, then a quarter inch of dense polyester, then an eighth inch of poly felt, and then a linen scrim on top of it, on top of which goes the leather. Now, this was a prototype we built in the shop for testing this, and it's a great cutaway version of what was actually done on all the gallery chairs, and essentially, on the counselor chairs as well. It is, there's a huge amount of time that went into this. Originally there was horsehair and cotton used. That tends to break down with use. In 20 years, those pads underneath that are cotton and, and hair usually break into pieces. This is a system that will not. It will maintain its strength, it will maintain its integrity, and will not separate. In addition, we didn't have seat pads, not one seat panel for these gallery chairs, not one. What you see here is a large Xerox copy kind of made up to look like the, the back that we do, did have plenty of, and so we reproduced it in a copy, fit it to the chair, Ron did a lot of experimenting on size and so on, cut it and fit it to the chair because the seat panels were to be all one piece of leather. You see the, the bordered, uh, embossed leather turns and wraps down the edge of the chair all in one piece. There aren't sides that are separate from the top. That's different than we ultimately did in the counselor chairs, but in these chairs it's all one piece. So we developed what the pattern and the size would be. Once those were being made then, Ron was developing patterns from which to cut these leather panels once they arrived. Believe me, when you deal with leather, of the quality and frankly the expense that we were going through, you don't want to overcut on a piece of leather. It'll leave a hole in the seat. It has to be fit just so. If it's too short, it'll cause bubbles in the leather. It'll cause it to buckle. If you cut it too long, you're gonna have holes and it's, you've done irreparable damage. So you have to develop panels for that purpose. Now in addition, once you get the patterns cut, here you see Ron in action, starting to cut the corners 
because these, all four of these panels have to surround all four legs of the chair and fit very snugly and very perfectly on the chair. And here you see him cutting. Once you cut into the center, you cut it so that it can surround the leg as tightly as humanly possible. L these literally look like they were painted on top of the chair. They're so beautifully fit to the, to the uh, piece of furniture. And as well, here's a little trick and all, something I'd never seen before. You'll notice here's where the, the edges of the cushion wrap the vertical leg post and the bronze nails that were used to hold it in place. There is a seam right on the corner and the, there's a return on that seam. Seam comes out, wraps around. When you double a piece of, whoops, excuse me, when you double a piece of leather over on itself, you can end up with a real fat kind of wad of leather that you really don't want. One, it's easy to catch things on, and two, it doesn't look very good. The way to make that look good is to take the flap you're folding under and cut the thickness of the leather in half. How do you do that, you say? By a little process called skiving. It's a small little kind of spade-shaped knife, very sharp, and if you're really skilled, and Mr. Doulis is very skilled, he shaved half the thickness of the leather off of the back, leaving the finish there so that when it was folded over on itself, it was a very thin, trim joint and the tacks were put in place. So there's a lot more than meets the eye when you look at the restoration of these chairs. Now, in addition, we finished the work on the, on the gallery chairs and we were kind of saying, oh goody, now we get to do the really big ones. These are the two types of counselor chairs that were found in the room. There were a total of seven of them, only one of the one on the right and six of the one on the left. We took the best one of the six on the left, put it in our archive, so we'll always have that one as a reference. Even though there's been repair done in the 1960s, it's as close to the original as we have and the rest of them will be restored. Now, another thing to note on this, because it'll come to the very tail end of this presentation, you'll notice the one on the right has a higher back, and it also has two very interesting what are called finials on top of them. Well, those finials are actually a wood carver's answer to an ear of corn, because that's in fact what they are. They're a square ear of corn with leaves folded over. Regrettably, these two finials on the top of the chair have gone through quite a few harvests and, the, and, the, and the, the husking of that thing have been broken off. These finials, because they were at the top of the chair, were banged into the wall so many times, chunks of it were knocked off, pieces were broken, they were put in, back in place with finished nails. It was just kind of a moth-eaten wreck. And so not only were we going to restore the, the, the chairs in terms of the upholstery, we were going to deal with those ears of corn because as Nebraskans, we know what corn ought to look like. Now, much the same process was used when it came to the restoration of these chairs, just on a bigger, more elaborate and complex scale. Here you see Don Hickman, who now that Ron has retired, Don worked with Ron for a year, maybe a little more, and she took Ron's place when Ron decided to retire. We were sorry he did that, but we keep him on a short leash and bring him back in as a consultant from time to time. He's just finishing a report on this project, which I've gotten on my computer of late. So I appreciate Ron's work, not only in the past, but in the modern time. Here you see Don working on deupholstering this, taking the fringe, which is really an anemic little strand of, of fringe. It's probably an inch, inch and a quarter long. They needed to be, the fringe needed to be nearly three inches in length to be in scale with the chair from the archival photographs that we had. In addition, you'll notice there's a big, what I call a drop side on these chairs. There's a big vertical side on the seat cushion. Well, originally, that was all one piece of leather, just like the smaller chairs. And th the trick to this is, those vertical sides that are very tall also had embossed borders on them, polychrome, black and gold. So you talk about a complicated piece to try to upholster, you gotta get that panel perfectly sitting on top of the seat, then you have to wrap it over the edge and make sure it fits the edge right where you want the fringe to be. So this was standard procedure in the 1920s and it's very complicated to do. Now, once Dawn gets done with her work of deupholstering this chair, we start doing kind of analysis on this. We develop a seat pan. This image 
is of the vertical sides of the chair because they don't exist. You can see in this slide, there is none of that ornament. This is all vinyl. We needed to reproduce those side panels because we made a conscious decision here. One, we decided to, it would be, we're worried about being able to repair and maintain these chairs. So when we look at a chair like this, we said, we're going to deliberately make the sides separate from the top. A couple of reasons. One, it allows for easier replacement because the part of the chair that's going to wear out first is where people sit, up and down, up and down. That panel is going to be replaced more frequently than the vertical sides will be replaced. They had no choice when they restored or put the vinyl on them in 64 because they were all one piece. And they didn't have the skill or the patience to cut the sides off and leave them in place. So we made a conscious decision to put a seam where there is a seam here. Now I'll go one more. It shows you the vertical sides that went on these chairs. And this is what we took from the back panels that we did have did rubbings on them and kind of extrapolated through archival photographs what these side panels really looked like and then sent them to, the, to Belgium to have them reproduced in the fashion that Ron had suggested they be. In addition, this is what the backs look like. This is the pattern from which we made that drawing previously. And these are taken off the back of the counselor chairs. And you'll notice these large square indentions along the bottom of this piece. That shows how large the ornamental nails, those pierced bronze nails were. Uh, they are probably in the range of about an inch and a half on a side. Very beautiful pieces, many of which were missing, which we had to have reproduced. In addition, there you are. There are all those ornamental nails all laid out on a piece of styrofoam, all documented by chair on which chair they came off of and which chair they're going back onto. And so we keep track of all this. Our bookkeeping is better in the shop than I can do at home, I can tell you that. These pieces show all of the nails. It marks the ones that are damaged. We did repair to those, had reproductions made. And I, I, these chairs are all in place. I encourage you to go to the governor's office one day, walk in, and see if you can tell which one's the original and which one isn't. On the back of the head, there's some identification, but not on the front. Now, in addition, here is the mock-up of the seat. And this is what we did. We made the top cushion a separate piece from the sides, reproduced that ornamental border around the outside, but left the seat panels unfinished in terms of they were just a solid color background. No border, no, no uh, uh, further polychrome on them. The second reason we did that is because you'll see in a, in a couple, of, uh, couple more slides, these chairs are behind a table. And so people don't walk into the room and look around the room and see that those panels on the seat are missing. And when they're not behind the table, they're pulled out and somebody's sitting on them. So either way, you don't see the top of that seat unless you're the person occupying that chair. So we felt, one, we could conceal it. And number three, third reason, one, for maintenance. Two, we felt we could, it was better for the long term to do it that way. And third, it saved us some money. And we bought additional solid color panels for the purpose of reproducing the horizontal panels of these chairs themselves. Now, that's the mock-up. There's the finished product. That shows you what those chairs look like. There was an enormous amount of work put into how the edge of that top panel that, that is the replace, panel that we can replace, huge amount of R&D to make sure that was the proper fall. It was radius like the original chairs. But the sides will remain. The back will remain because they're vertical. They'll mean get very little contact. And the horizontal panel of the, of the chair is the one that is, is uh, reusable. Now, let's get to the governor's chair and start talking about those walnut ears of corn that we love so much in Nebraska. On the right, it shows some pretty big hunks of walnut missing. Some of those corner ears and so on have been snapped off. Part of the husk is missing. You can see that the actual ear of corn are, is the grid at the very top, and that's the corn itself, but below it, that's the husk, and it's in pretty tough shape. So on the left is the block, and in between them is the pattern that Mike Marshall, our cabinet maker at the Capitol, who, and, and as I say, ladies and gentlemen, this is, this is sculpture as much as it is rebuilding and restoring a chair. Now I'm going to walk you through a few slides that show what was done. Here's the full panel that he'd done and some of the patterns that he made to fashion the walnut to start cutting it into the shape needed to reproduce these. In addition, here's Mike 
You notice this little jig that he's holding this piece in? Really good craftsman. If they need a jig to hold a special part, they make a jig. I'd go over it and stick in a device and probably crack it. But they make a special tool, maybe lined with leather, and they make a tool that does is just for the job. They also make tools, hand tools, to get the job done because you can't go into a store and buy everything you need. So really good craftsmen often have a lot of strange looking tools and jigs and so on you could never buy, but they were custom made for something they needed to do. Now here's Mike measuring off where those kernels of corn are going to be on this, on this particular piece. And here he is with one of the world's smallest chisels and he's starting to carve the grooves that's going to separate these little squares that make those kernels of corn on this, ear, on, on this uh, uh, ear of corn. Here he is striking in the other direction. You can see he's already done some carving on the vertical face that's f facing you. And here you are. Four, not two, four reproduction finials for the top of the chair. Very handsome pieces, dead on match, and one of the few things you, you don't know that was done as part of this, you'll notice where these husks fold over and hang down, there's more meat behind those leaves. And it was done deliberately by Mike to give a little more mass to that so in case it does bump something, it has more to resist cracking and breaking off like the predecessors were. Now, those are the unfinished final product. There they are sitting the, on the right, the original one missing half of its pieces. On the left, the one yet unfinished. This shows Mr. Doulis at work at his bench once again. He's putting the finish on these so they will match the chairs as precisely as possible, and they do match precisely. They're just now complete carved finials instead of fractured carved finials. And here's the entire assembly of chairs. You'll notice we're missing one because that's in the archive. We only use five chairs in the hearing room. The governor's is in the center. There are two on each side because the commissions the bo and boards of the governor chairs rarely require more than five seats, including the governor. So we have one chair in reserve. This shows the fringe, a little bit bigger than the last fringe you saw that Dawn was taking off, and it gives you a sense of how incredibly elaborate the backs and seats of these chairs were. The one in the center for the governor the arms completely rebuilt, the structure completely in good shape, and I dare say the people who sold these to us to begin with would probably have a hard time figuring out how in 2016 we have chairs that match exactly what they put in place into, in 1927. Now, we weren't about to take these chairs up and let them befall the same circumstance that occurred when they were first installed in the room, and so we did a little, bought, or bought ourselves an insurance policy that we made in the shop. And it is this. You'll notice there's a little strip behind the leg of that chair. Now that's a piece of oak, because the floor is oak. That's a piece of oak plywood with a vinyl edge along the edge of it. Now that chair, if you're careful, doesn't go any further or closer to the wall than that, which keeps the chair a safe inch away from the wall. Now that's pretty much the case on all walls, all three walls. There's a fireplace on the fourth wall. That's what's done on all three walls in the room to help us ensure, not a guarantee, but help us ensure that we don't see those chairs coming back into our shop in short order where it's a double whammy. When these chairs hit the wall, they scuff the wall, which we don't want, and they beat up the chair. So we just protected the wall from the chair and vice versa. And here is the final product. If you look closely, you can see that buffer around the floor in the niche behind it. And there are the five chairs. And imagine there were originally seven. It was real cozy. I think they had to take a number to know who was going to get up first so they could get out and in in proper order. But this is what the room looks like today. Now, I, 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 per, I personally and deliberately did not show you the entire room completed. If you look in the lower left of the screen and the lower right, you can see the backs of those gallery chairs restored sitting facing those uh, counselor chairs at the head of the room. To see the finished product, you got to come down yourself and you need to come into the Capitol so you can see them all in there 
together like they're intended to be. No photograph I can take will give you a full appreciation of what was done. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I will close my immediate comments on this project by saying this. I have never sat down and really tried to determine how much money we save by having our own forces in-house do this work. But the cost, is in, cost savings is enormous. When we started this process and we, were, we started into the reupholstery and putting this new leather on these gallery chairs, which is where we started, we started with a, a professional upholster, very, very capable gentleman uh, by the name of Buckminster, who has a shop in Falls City, and the first dozen or so chairs we ran through his shop. We soon realized, through Ron and Bill and other people's efforts, we had the skill to do this internally. In fact, we had the skill to do it as well, if not better because there were concerns that we could always address as they came up. So although it took us 11 years, if you take the cost of those chairs when they were purchased in 1927, now bear in mind, you need to remember this, and this was part of a newspaper article. In 1927, the gallery chair, I'll just use that as an example, the gallery chairs themselves were purchased for $135 a piece. Now, you could buy a standard solid oak office chair for between ten and twelve dollars in nineteen twenty seven the state spent a hundred and thirty five dollars a chair on the gallery chairs alone if you inflate a hundred and thirty five dollars per chair from nineteen twenty seven to two thousand sixteen it's just under two thousand dollars a chair with our own labor internally that is about what we spent to restore them, and that's materials, not labor. You can probably double that figure if you, because labor is typically half or more of the cost of doing work. You can about double that figure if we'd have gone to an outside shop to have the work done. So it's a remarkable piece of work that was done by Nebraskans for Nebraska's capital. And in so doing, with the talent we have at the Capitol and that we have here, we were able to save an enormous amount of money in restoring an irreplaceable asset as part of the governor's suite in the Capitol. Now, I'm going to do one more thing before I open it up for some Q&A. I hope you have some. I'm gonna introduce some people who are part of the team who are, who are here today. First, uh, the two people who probably worked most, put the most time in, one in the office with me, Tom Casper, is seated back here with his wife, Donna. Tom, raise your hand if you would please. Thank you very much, and thank you for 40 years of dedicated service. I've done a lot of learning from this gentleman over time. And Tom was handling the front end and all the, trying to get all the product put together in the consultation and working with consultants and so on. And then when the product got here, we went into the shop and the gentleman who led the charge in the shop with the hands on the product was a gentleman by the name of Ron Dulles. And Ron, if you'd be so kind to wave at the crowd, thank you. <laughs> These two gentlemen spent an enormous amount of time and, a tr and then were the leadership in the process of getting these chairs restored. So it's a remarkable tribute to them. It is tremendous work for the Capitol. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a world-class landmark in our building, and it isn't just the building, it's the furnishings within it. So it's something to take enormous pride in. One more philosophical note, and then I'm going to Q&A. We use the best museum standards and policies we possibly can to do things like restore these chairs. There's a huge difference between us and a museum. We use the same techniques, we use the same care, we do the same materials, we put the best energy and craftsmanship into the work, but when a museum's done, they take the chairs like you saw here, they take them in, they put them in a case behind glass, or they put a velvet cord across the arms so no one can sit in them. We turn around and put them right back on the floor and let people use them like they have since they were installed in the building. That's the ultimate glory of the building. It isn't that it's a museum. The ultimate glory of the building is it's a museum quality environment preserved in that fashion but still used for the function it was designed for. Still using it for its fu original function, in my opinion, more than doubles the value of the building because it isn't just a place you walk in to see gathering dust. It's a place where people use it every day. Government's been using this building every day since it was finished. 
and we're doing everything we can to make sure it continues for centuries to come. Now, I'm done using the air in the room and I'll stop speaking and allow a few of you to have a chance to, uh, to ask a question or two. Yes? When was this restoration finished? Good question. Carol asked, when was the restoration finished? We began the work in 2005 and we, we put the last of the chairs in place in between Christmas and New Year's 2015. So it was a total of 11 years elapsed time. Now bear in mind, our people weren't working on just this project for 11 years. Our shop takes care of the standard interior furnishings of the building, very nice pieces of furniture that were standard office equipment, they're walnut chairs with leather and so on. That's what we do day in and day out. We fit this in around the other work. So it was 11 years elapsed time but it wasn't non-stop 11 years worth of work. Other questions? Yes, sir. There are uh, other rooms in the chapel that are sort of ceremonial as these rooms are here. Are you looking at restorations in those locations? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, another, there are two rooms. The question was, do we have other preservation spaces or elaborately finished spaces in the building that we intend to do similar sorts of restoration? And yes, we don't have chairs exactly like the governor's suite, but we have seven chairs behind the Supreme Court bench for the seven justices of the Supreme Court. We have, we have similar high back chairs for the appeals court judges as well. We have a number of places in the building where, and those were as well, those were embossed, polychrome bordered pieces of leather. We have photographs of them. We have none of the leather. We at least had some of the leather here. But through our archive and through the research we can do, we have every intention eventually, whether it's me doing it, Tom doing it, Ron, or whatever generation, the intent is to continue to put that material back. We've learned a lot in the last roughly 100 years about how to take care of leather and materials. And so we anticipate that what we do when we do restore them like we did here, we can do a better job and allow for maintenance in an easier, more cost-effective fashion. Another question. Yes, Gene. Uh, Bob, what is, for the sake of discussion, your preservation budget versus your operation budget? Good question. A uh, uh, question was asked, what, what are the budgets we deal with? We are funded in about three different fashions. One, we have an operating budget, which takes care of utilities, which is the single biggest internal expense we pay for each year, heating and cooling in the building, electricity, and so on. That takes care of salary and benefits and those sorts of things for our staff and so on. That is um, one portion of our budget. That is around $3 million. Now, we also have a fund called the 901 program, which is a sum of money we're given to do projects and sometimes it's renovating offices. We have a capital master plan that defines all the projects in the building we'd like to do. And we go through that master plan, which has been approved by the Capital Commission, and we prioritize which we think is the next most important job, and we put those priorities down, and we go as far down the list. We've got a book. We, we, there isn't enough money right now to be able to do all the work we'd like to do on the building, but we prioritize from that master plan what the next most important project is, and we go as far down that list as our money will take us. And that is typically about a half million dollars. So has traditionally, it's been as high as a million dollars a year, and it's been, it's, there have been some years we didn't get any new money, but usually it's been kind of averaging and out at about a half million dollars a year. And that is the fund we primarily used over a period, this 11 year period of time, to fund the restoration you just saw and we parcel it out. Sometimes we don't have enough money to buy all of the leather in one year. We buy a little this year. We set aside some money and carry over the next year. So we kind of, like you do at home, we live within our means. It's one thing Nebraska's always done, and uh, we are no exception. So we work with the money we have, and we stretch our dollar as far as we can. When we have talent like we do in our shops, it really helps us stretch our money, like twice what it is to most everyone else. Other question? The four houses on the chairs, do you have any idea kind of a ballpark how many hours it took just to redo those? Oh, boy. You know, since I wasn't in the shop, 
Ron, would you be willing to venture a guess on how many hours Mike took to, to build those four? With drawing and everything like that, he could have 40 hours of Is that for all four of them? Or is that for pre? pre? Well, yeah, I mean, if he had just solid time on it, start to finish, and he knew everything about it, you know, what, how it's going to work out with the jigs and everything like that. But, you know, if you count all that time, then you could probably have 80 hours into okay. it. You know, so the, that's Right. The question was, how many hours did it take to build those four finials? And the, the answer, as best we can estimate, is if our cabinet maker, Mike Marshall, had had all the time he needed and was un not interrupted from start to finish, which never happens, um, he probably took him over two or three or four weeks to get it done, but if he'd had all the time in, at one time to get it done, between 40 and 80 hours, um, we're not, we don't know exactly, but like I say, Mike fits it in wherever he can. Similar sort of thing happened with regard to the chairs and the restoration. We'd work on it for a solid block of time for several weeks, and then we'd get to a stopping point, and then we'd work on something else for a month or two. So it's kind of fitted in as we can in many cases. One more question, we've got about three minutes. Yes, sir? What did the users of the room sit on while the project was underway? <laughs> yeah. Met metal stack chairs. We'd like to think that they were very pleased getting soft leather chairs back in the room. <laughs> they certainly have a different look than those black painted metal chairs. So the question was, what did those who used the room use while the chairs were gone, that, those 11 years? And we brought in some metal stacking chairs. They, they work, but not for long duration of time, I can tell you that. I've sat in them longer than I'd like. So the leather chairs are very, are very comfortable and very beautiful. And again, I'll close by saying, come in and take a look at your capital. This is the governor's suite, and the hearing room is not in constant use, so you could go in and see what the whole ensemble looks like with chairs both front and back. Thank you for being here today and for your questions.